Well, welcome back. This is the Aquarium Online Academy, and we're doing a special week of activities. This is our Winter Kids Club. I'm so glad you could join us today. My name is James. I work in the Education Department here at the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach. I have my friend Amanda helping control all the fun magic behind me, and Miss Talia is on question control. If you've been tuning in before, you kind of know how this works, but let's review. You can participate. You get to text us questions during the program. Remember that text rates apply, so if you're one of our young viewers, make sure you can text us some questions. Right here is our number, 562-286-1838, and we'll have Miss Talia bring the questions live into the studio that we can answer for you on the air. Now, if you're watching this program not live Monday at 11, you can still ask us questions. We still have educators ready to answer your inquiries. So, the email down here, live at lbaop.org. You can email us some questions, and we'll have our educators get back to you on those. So, all day today, we've been talking about groups of animals. We already talked about the cnidarians, like jellies and anemones, these things flowing in the breeze right here. We talked about arthropods last time. It's kind of the creepy crawlies, bugs of the ocean, like crabs and lobsters. But this one is going to be a little different. These are one of my favorite of the invertebrate animals, the animals without backbones. They're not super charismatic or creepy crawly because they are not much for crawling, but they are pretty interesting. It's the sea stars and things like sea stars. Do you notice any sea stars in our video here? Let's make some observations together. Since we're all scientists, we all make observations and ask questions. Let's see if we can find a sea star. Hmm. I think I found a few. What do you think? Is that a sea star? Yep. What about that one? Seems like it. What about that one? Hmm, that does seem like a sea star. How did you know it was a sea star and not that thing? That's a little greenling fish. How do we know that's a sea star? Well, we draw stars, don't we? Do the five point kind of sea star. Or if you're super advanced, you don't crisscross in the middle. I still crisscross in the middle. So when you draw sea stars, they might look like this, or stars in general. Most of the time, when we see a sea star, we see something like this. It has how many arms? Let's count off the arms. One, two, three three, four, five. Most sea stars that we probably have seen or looked at on, online have that body type. But we'll take a look at some other stars because they do get some pretty interesting designs to their body. There is a special star that I don't think we've had at the aquarium for a while, but it's called the nine arm star. What? Yeah, it's kind of orange and blue and it has nine arms. And that's normal for it. There's other sea stars that are really big and have lots and lots of arms on their body. So we'll talk more about sea star differences. But what else is related to a sea star? Hmm. Let's think. What else might be like a sea star? This actually is kind of a tough one. This is why I like this group of animals so much. is because they're closely related, but they kind of look very different. Now, I have a couple questions coming in. So we'll go through some of those. Oh, some great observations, not questions. Miss Amador's class, thank you for tuning in again. You're noticing the colors, the oranges, the pinks. There's also this one. This sea star has like kind of a tealy blue color. It's hard to tell in this video, but when you look at it, the edges of the body kind of have this very light teal or blue color around them. And they have a lot of pink and red in the middle. There can even be some that are kind of brownish in color, too. Or almost maroon. So sea stars have lots of colors. Now, the other cool thing is, like, these sea stars right here have lots of bumps on their body, too. We'll talk about what the bumps are in a little bit. Edward did ask, how many colors of sea stars are there? The whole rainbow. Let's just go with that. Because there's a lot of different colors. In this one exhibit space, this is our Northern Touch Lab. There's some purple ones, some pink ones. There's a couple of blue ones, actually. Orange. There's a little bit of yellow. Yellow's not as uh, much on the sea stars in this exhibit, but there are some that do have yellow on their bodies. Um, talking about purple, brown. There might be green ones. I'm not sure I've seen a green one before. 
but we'll find out. We can take a look at a few different kinds of sea stars if you like. Now, sea stars here in California look like this. In other parts of the world, in the warm water habitats, they might look a little bit different. One of the kind of cool ones is called a chocolate chip star because on the top of their body, they have these big bumps that look like somebody just glued little chocolate chips on their body. That's kind of a cool sea star. There's also sand stars. This is the bottom of a chocolate chip star, actually. So you can't see the little chocolate chips, but this is a really cool picture to talk about more about the body of a sea star. So we can't figure out their cousins. Let's at least figure out why they're called sea star or why they're called echinoderms, which is a big group name. The whole group, everybody in this group, is called an echinoderm. That's a big fancy word. All right. You're right. I should write it down for you real quick. Now, when you look at echinoderms, they all, they all share a particular characteristic. Do you remember what the cnidarians shared, if you were watching earlier today? It was stinging tentacles and stinging cells. Do you remember what all the arthropods Miss Amanda was talking about had? They had exoskeletons. I don't think we could count the number of times she said exoskeleton. She said it a lot. Because that's what they all have. It's a very important thing to talk about. Now, it's taken me a while to write this word because it's a big word. Echinoderm. Well, if we look at what this means, we can break it into two basic sections. Derm means skin. So something about their skin. Well, let's make an observation. What, what does the skin of an anemone look like? Does it look rough and scratchy? No, they're pretty smooth. So just on the name alone, we can't put anemones in this group. What do the urchins and stars share with their skin? Some of them are bumpy, but urchins are kind of yeah, they're kind of spiky, aren't they? So we can call that spiny. So the echinoderms are the spiny-skinned animals. Sometimes the spines are really rough and tall. Sometimes they're really wide. Sometimes they just have rough skin, but they still share all the other characteristics, even if they don't have spikes sticking out of their body. Now, their sneaky cousin, who is not in a star or ball shape, still has some spiny skin on their body. So let's take a look at this exhibit right here real quick. We have sea stars. This one's called a bat star. This one is a ochre star. But we also have their cousins, the sea urchins in here. Now, this is a purple urchin, and that's a red urchin. Urchins kind of have it easy. They just kind of get named after their color a lot of the time, not all urchins. The ones here got it easy. Purple urchins, red urchins, green urchins, and pink urchins. Could have made it even simpler than that. But then, their, their sneaky little cousin, there's one here, whoop, right there, and one way up here. Well, does this look as spiny and pokey as an urchin or a sea star? It's bumpy, not really spiny looking. That little thing right there is called a sea cucumber. Some sea cucumbers are just kind of smooth. They look like a cucumber out of your garden. But other sea cucumbers do have spiny looking skin. But remember, they're the sneaky ones. They are pretending to be really spiny. Their skin is actually very, very smooth. And the spines, if you touched them, wouldn't feel very rough at all. Actually, they're pretty much just a big squish cylinder. Sea cucumbers are related to the sea stars and the sea urchins, though. Parts of their anatomy and other parts of the, how their bodies grow and develop make them related to sea stars and sea cucumbers. Now, there's another cousin to the urchins called... Oh, here we go. Here is a spiny-looking sea cucumber. So when you look at their bodies, they, they have spiny-looking skin. They have these little feet like all the other echinoderms have. But if you went and you touched this one, it would actually be very, very smooth. And sometimes when they get scared, they puff up, they kind of shrink up into a little ball, puff, and then it, it must be harder to try and chew on them. So if something doesn't get fooled by the fake spines on their body, they try to, they can puff up on their body, which is kind of fun. I'll talk about their really, really uh, 
and not usual adaptation. And I say that because not a lot of things can do this. I'll talk about that one later because it's gross and fun, which are my favorite facts. Okay, let's go back to this space. So when you look at urchins, stars, and sea cucumbers, and they live in a space like this, what do you think it takes to survive there? Well, in this exhibit, we have the water moving, not only to help keep the exhibit clean, but to help provide some of that natural flow that the animals would experience. So if they're at the edge of the ocean, shoreline, what we call the intertidal zone, so you have the low tide and the high tide. In the high tide, everybody's underwater, except the barnacles way at the top of the zone. And then at low tide, a lot of them are exposed. But there might still be some water left behind. And you get these tide pools. So these indentations, these big rocks that have gaps in there, and the water gets stuck behind when the tide goes down, that's a tide pool. Imagine you've, you, you don't need to do this because you don't need to use all that water, but imagine you filled up your kitchen sink with water. They put a bowl in there. You gotta kind of have to make it sink a little bit, okay? And then you let the sink drain, but you kept the bowl of water in place. If you don't move the bowl, does the water leave? stays right there. So unless you tip the bowl over to dump the water out, when the sink water is all gone, there's still that bowl of water left behind. That's kind of how a tide pool works. The ocean drops down a little bit because of the moon. The ocean drops down a little bit at the edge, and those pools are left behind that house these animals. So during a low tide, it can get pretty stressful for animals. The water temperature can easily change because there's a smaller amount of water like trying to boil a big pot of water versus a little pot of water. If you've never done that, that's okay. You can ask an adult what that, how long that takes. But then you might have just kind of animals that are left behind in the wet that don't have any water on top of them anymore. This is actually a great picture of a tide pool where they are so high up compared to the water that they actually get it completely exposed to the air. Now, sometimes that means the tide actually went way, way, way down. So everybody gets exposed at that edge. Remember high tide? Low tide is when it's down. You can have a really low tide so that more animals get exposed. Now, when we look at our animals here, a lot of our friends that are watching from uh, wherever, home, car, wherever you are, are asking some good questions about them. Casey's asking, are sea anemones and starfish related? Well, they're in the same spot, aren't they? They live in the same habitat. They have the same struggles of the water going up and down at least once a day. But think about what makes the animal part of its group. So in science, we like to define everything. We have to describe everything. The goal of science is to describe everything. But when you look at the groups, we kind of put them together based off of characteristics. And sometimes we put them together because they all live in the same spot. Then we learn a little bit more. We go, ooh, they might not need to be in the same, in the same group because they have very different bodies. The anemones have stinging tentacles. Sea stars don't have stinging tentacles, but they do have this spiny, knobby, rough skin. So they might live in the same habitat, but we're going to separate them because of characteristics or of parts of their body that they have. So sometimes we can just describe animals based off of what they do. Like we have pointed teeth to eat meat and flat teeth to eat plants. So we get put into a group called the omnivores. They get different rules. Now, an anemone will honestly eat whatever it can shove in its mouth. So they probably should be an omnivore. I have seen them eat seaweed. Sea stars, not really big fans of seaweed, but they do like to eat lots of other animals. So they're a carnivore. We don't have to have teeth to be carnivores. That's kind of cool. They just have to eat other animals to be called a carnivore. So we can group things together because of their abilities, their bodies, or even sometimes where they live. Now, Alexa is asking, how big or small do the stars get? Now, Alexa, I'm so glad you asked that because one of my favorite sea stars is huge. It's the sunflower star. Now, we don't have a picture of the top of a sunflower star, but we do have a picture of the underside of a sunflower star. We'll try to show you that in a second. While we're looking for a sunflower star picture, I'll get out of the way so we can have some more fun watching the animals in the water. Uh, John John's asking, was one camouflaged in there? They do like to camouflage. 
So we'll go back in a, in a sec. Let's look at the sunflower star. Could you imagine trying to buy shoes for a sunflower star? These are not their feet. That is their arm. All these little things in here look real close. All these little things. Those are their feet. They're called tube feet. Not tuba feet or not two feet. Tubes. Like a straw is a tube. All their little feet are like straws with gluey, sticky ends on the bottom. So they can stick onto something and suck it in. So they can stick onto things. Like the walls, the windows of our exhibits, rocks, and even their food. So these little tube feet help every sea star, urchin, and sea cucumber walk around. Now their longest are their flat toes and sand dollars. A little bit different. Talk about the feet of everybody around. And we have another one. Okay, cool. So here's a picture of their feet. Now, because sunflowers are, are so big and have so many they get about four feet long. Right on. That's a pretty big Now some of the smallest stars are pretty small. But the biggest thing does come up. But when all those feet are working together, they can walk pretty fast. I haven't done my sea star in first name. Once you find a first name, you start walking. Okay, ready? I'm going to use my arms and legs like they are the arms of the my head is number five. And they just go okay, Ready? And let's start running. Ooh, this is really tiring. Okay. It's not very fast, is it? No, they aren't going to be very quick. So they don't really chase their food a lot. But the sun, remember, the sunflower star can walk pretty fast. It will chase its food, which actually is other kinds of stars called the brittle stars. Because brittle, like it breaks easily. And there are some videos that actually you can check them out after we're done. You can watch how a sunflower star will chase its prey, which are other sea stars. So the other sea stars have to walk out of the way so they don't get chewed on by a sunflower star. So Addison's asking, Addison's asking if there's other animals that eat these oh here's actually a top of a sunflower star we're having a little bit of trouble with my microphone may get some static it's okay to tell us if the microphone's not working we actually appreciate it because we don't always get to hear what's going on thank you uh addison was asking do other animals eat sea stars well remember this one will eat other kinds of stars who wants to eat a sea star they have bony chunks in their skin, and literally it's bone. It's, they're called ossicles. Bony plates in their skin. It makes it kind of tough to chew on them. Who's going to eat that? Hmm. Ah, oh, you're right, Amanda. They will eat that. Who is that? That's a sea otter. Sea otters will pick up sea stars and eat them. Now, the funny thing about that is otters are very concerned about their fur. Just like I make sure my hair looks good before I'm on camera, they pretend they're always on camera. They're grooming so often. They need to protect their fur. So when they pick up a sea star, remember all those little feet can crawl around and grab onto stuff? They might pick up two stars and put them foot to foot side and make it like a sea star sandwich before they come up to the surface to eat because they don't want something to mess up their fur. And sea stars don't want to get eaten, so you know they have to work against each other to try and make one survive over the other. But otters are pretty smart, and they're pretty good about finding prey. So usually the otter will win against the sea star. But there's also other things that eat them. I've actually seen anemones eat a sea star. Remember, you can be a carnivore without teeth. That's pretty amazing. The anemone can just shove things in its mouth, and as long as it can hold on to it, it'll slowly digest it. So anemones can eat them. Otters, some fish will chew on them. Now sometimes it's very tough for a sea star to be eaten because it holds onto the rocks very well. So if you have paws or hands, it makes it a little bit easier. But also, if you're just a fish with really big teeth, that helps out too. Now, Sophia is asking, can stars and urchins survive outside the ocean? Well, we notice that normally they like to be underwater, but sometimes they are above the water during a low tide. They can't completely survive without the ocean. They might be able to survive for the short amount of time that the tide goes down below them and then back up above them. This could be three to six hours, depending on the, the speed of the tide schedule. 
So they can survive for a few hours outside of water, but they have to hold water inside their body in order to survive. Because they breathe through their skin, they're going to need to use water, kind of like we use an air tank when we scuba dive, to help survive. So for a little while, yes, Sophia, they can, but not forever. And some other kinds of stars and anemones would not do well at all in a tide pool because they don't normally live there. If you were a sea star that lived way, way, way deep in the ocean, you're more likely to survive under high pressure and low temperatures than the constant fluctuation of temperatures when you're in a tide pool. So that chocolate chip star we talked about earlier cannot live here. The chocolate chip star is not an intertidal or tide zone animal. These things that live here can survive that. They've adapted or developed the ability to survive in this space. Good question. Do you need to throw them back in? That's actually a really good idea. If you went to the shore, the, 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 the you know, tide pooling on your own, should you pick up the animals and toss them in? Well, sometimes we want to make sure that we're doing our part to help keep the animals alive, but we also want to respect nature and let nature do its own thing. Now, if you found a sea star on the beach, that's probably not the best space for it, but I also wouldn't want to alter the natural part of what's going on there. If you found one here, this is totally normal. But again, I wouldn't want to alter what they're doing, and I'd leave the sea star alone. I'll get right up next to them, take pictures, hang out by the animals, but I don't want to disturb the animals and change their location because that's kind of normal for them. So if they're along the coastline in these tide pools, maybe they do sometimes get into the sand. Yeah, that's where they're supposed to be. Now, if they were like 10 blocks from the beach, that's probably not where they're supposed to be. They should be back in the water. But if you find them along a tide pool, they are just fine where they're at. Good question. Now, Edward's asking if we hurt sea stars, we pick them up. So kind of the same idea, right? Should we move them? Well, remember, they like to stick to things with all these feet. You could hurt them if you pulled them up because their feet can hold on so strong, they might pull a couple off if you just pulled them up real hard. So like when a, a sea otter is doing that, remember the sea otter is trying to eat it. They're not concerned about how many feet the star loses. That's okay for them. But when we need to move a sea star, we actually have a couple of tricks. Now, sometimes you can just surprise them and pick them up real quickly, but there's other tools we can use to help get them to come off of a surface. And it's like, they don't like to touch these objects, so we've kind of help put the object underneath them and they start like, oh, I don't like to touch that. And so they'll start picking their feet up and we can move them. Now, if you found one at a tide pool, remember, just leave it where it is. They are completely happy where they're at. All right, let's see if we can watch the sea star moving a little bit. talk about. So stars and urchins and sand dollars, all the flatter ones, remember sea cucumbers are a little bit different. They, they actually are a little like tube, but they do eat off the floor. All those other animals have their mouth <laughs> or I mean a sand dollar is just kind of flat. Imagine an urchin without spines and a pancake. That's a sand dollar. They're a pancake urchin. That's a thing. So their mouths are underneath them and so they have to be on top of their food to grab it. So when we were looking at those sea star feet, in between the feet, remember they all radiate towards the middle, that's where the mouth is. This is the mouth of an urchin. So urchins do have teeth, sea stars do not. So how do they eat their food? Well, if an urchin has teeth, it takes bites of food, right? Like we would. The cool thing is the urchin has five teeth. You imagine all your fingers, like, kind of, like you're trying to make shadow puppets in the, on the wall, all those fingers pointed together in one point, that's how their mouth works. 
these jump, 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 jump. The C star does not have teeth. So what it does is one of my other favorite gross facts. We've got to talk about the uh, uh, safety ability that the cucumber has. But the C stars have to eat by everting or spitting out their stomach. Since they can't chew on anything, and their food likes to hide in a shell, like a clam, a mussel, a snail. But that's how a sea star needs to eat. You can see all their feet coming out. This is another chocolate chip star. Their feet coming out to stick to the window. And as long as they can crawl on top and over their food, they can eat it. If it's an animal with a shell, like a clam, clams have two shells. They can actually pry the shell open with their very strong feet. And then they spit their stomach inside, start digesting it. And then once they're all done, suck it everything in. That's just how sea stars work. Urchins chew on stuff. Sea stars spit out their stomach. Sand dollars are a little different. Sand dollars, in, some of them, will stick their bodies up and kind of catch plankton as it floats by. And then they have little tracks in their, in their shell that kind of help guide the food into their, stu or their mouth on the bottom, too. Other sand dollars are going to kind of glide around on the sand, and they just kind of eat their food off of the ground. So it kind of depends on the sand dollar and their behaviors. Now, Max was adding, asking what sea stars eat. Kind of got over that. Uh, uh, the clams, mussels, snails, pretty, they're actually pretty good scavengers. So if there's something left behind, they'll eat that too, especially parts of animals that have died. So they might all hang out near an animal that has deceased and as kind of leftovers come down from other animals chewing on stuff, they'll pick that up too. Now, remember, the sea cucumber has this really weird, interesting, but very gross way that they protect themselves. Imagine you were a little tiny cylindrical animal and you were being chased by a predator. How would you defend yourself? Because you can't run very fast. Well, the sea star spits out its stomach to feed, but a sea cucumber spits out its intestines to defend itself. Yeah, that's part of what they do. They will launch part of their intestines out the back end and help protect them. Those Parts, their bodies can actually be, have some toxins in them. They can stick to their predator and kind of be toxic. It makes a mess for the predator. The predator's trying to get all this stuff off of them, and it stops worrying about the sea cucumber. They will grow them back over time. It takes a while for those intestines to come back, but it is a pretty effective defense. All right, so Penguin Party, Winter Kids Club group, what is your activity tied with today? Well, to help quiz your knowledge about echinoderms, we have a word scramble on our event page for you. So if you go to the Aquarium of the Pacific's page where we can watch the classes from, check that out. You can click on today's class and the associated activity. You can download it. If you can print it out, go ahead. If you can't print it out, you can actually write down the answers on another piece of paper if you need to. But download the activity and anything you're doing with the Winter Kids Club this week, share your fun with us. Use the tag AOP Kids Club on any of your social media that you like to share what's going on. You can also tag the aquarium on our social media too, and we can have some fun exploring together. Well, we have one more class today for our Winter Kids Club activity. The next one is going to be one of my favorite things we get to do here. I do say viewer discretion advised because we are gonna be doing a squid dissection in the studio with Miss Talia. So, who's been answering your questions the last half hour? She's gonna be doing your squid dissection. We'll see you at 12 o'clock. Enjoy the rest of your Winter Kids Club.